Hello and welcome to Let's Talk on WISR 680 AM. I'm Ryan Saylor and today I'm joined on the phone by Dr. Brian Donner, Chief Medical Officer and Co-Founder of Compassionate Certification Centers. Hello and welcome to the show, Dr. Donner. Hi, Ryan. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Let's start with uh, a little bit of background on yourself. Tell us a little bit about where you're from and how you got started in medicine and some of your experiences before uh, you started with Compassionate Certification Centers. Absolutely. So I'm I'm from the greater Pittsburgh area myself. I actually grew up in the uh, in the North Hills of Pittsburgh. I uh, I went to medical school in Pennsylvania as well at uh, at Lake Erie College of Osteopathic Medicine, and then I got board certified in uh, emergency medicine, and I've done some fellowship training in wound care and hyperbaric medicine. And then over over my career, I spent a lot of time as a, a clinical investigator for research trials, and that's really where. Uh, my my interest, I think, in medical cannabis uh, shaped up. So I, I'm now uh, I live in uh, in Butler County, as a matter of fact. So I'm still a local guy here with uh, my wife and and my kids. Awesome. Uh, tell us, if you would, a little bit more about the history of Compassion Certification Centers. Where did that idea come from, and who all was involved to make that possible? And how has the organization changed since uh, the the mission when it was formed? Absolutely. It's a question we, we get relatively frequently. So Compassionate Certification Centers was formed just uh, just under five years ago by uh, myself as well as our co-founder and our CEO, Melanie Kachi. Uh, and really the idea behind Compassionate Certification Centers was to uh, provide brick-and-mortar locations uh, for to help support medical cannabis patients uh, and not only to help them obtain their medical marijuana certifications and their, their cards, but also to provide a, a support network. Uh, uh, with them. So we started off uh, years ago, as I said, r- literally with one clinic and uh, uh, myself and another doctor. We've, we've since uh, greatly expand, expanded over the years to the point where uh, we, we think, I think we have uh, nine or ten brick and mortar, cl- brick and mortar clinics currently. Um, these are located through uh, all through Pennsylvania, um, really mostly mainly cl- clustered in uh, western and central PA. Um, and we've seen about uh, 40,000 medical cannabis patients so far in the state of Pennsylvania from the inception of their medical marijuana program up until today. Excellent. Um, I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page um, to to get some definitions here from a medical expert like yourself. Uh, Can you tell me and our listeners a little bit about what exactly is CBD, what is THC, and what is the difference between the two? Absolutely, and uh, this is another common question. And these are what these are called, or these are cannabinoids. And what cannabinoids are, they're molecules within the uh, cannabis species of plant. And these are what we would call some of the bioactive molecules in the in the cannabis species. So, um, THC. We said one, CBD or cannabidiol, that's another one. There's actually over 100 of these cannabinoids in the plant that can have some bioactive uh, properties to them or can have an impact on human, human physiology. Um, every human being actually what has what's called an endocannabinoid system in, in, within their body. And this is a system of uh, receptors and these molecules that bind to these receptors, and then they have a downstream uh, physiological response. Our body makes some of these cannabinoids on their own. These are called endocannabinoids. The cannabinoids that come from the plant, just like THC and CBD, these are called phytocannabinoids, and they're structurally very similar to the um, the internal cannabinoids that our body makes, and they can interact with those receptors within the endocannabinoid system, and that's how they have their, their therapeutic or medicinal value. Okay. Um, I've heard tell of CBD that, that's high quality, and I'm kind of unclear about what kind of factors give CBD high quality, and why is it important that CBD is of high quality? That's, that's a great question, and, and I would preface it with that uh, um, in science, a, a molecule of CBD is a molecule of CBD. When we discuss that maybe not all CBD is created uh, equally, what we're talking about are the, the end stream or the downstream final products that, that, that patients are consuming. So whenever we talk about this, all products are not lab tested in the same type of way. All products don't have the same combination of different cannabinoids. All products may not 
that have different um, uh, different what's called terpenes, what could be in them, or essential oils. So, so there's going to be different ratios of cannabinoids, different amounts within the product, and honestly, different type of products through what we would call different routes of administration as well. So, for example, imagine a CBD product. One may be applied topically versus another one that could be uh, taken orally, right? And they would have different, uh, um, different physiological properties for the patients, how they're taking them. So when we talk about when all CBD is not created equally, it's not talking about the individual molecule. It's really talking about the products that are out there today and available to consumers and the differences between those products. That makes sense. Um, what kind of differences are there between CBD products with THC and without? And are there different uses for or benefits of that are provided by each of those? So it's a, it's a very complicated question, and I'll try to give you the best uh, the, the best answer sure. that that I can. So. Technically, uh, by the lay of the law, uh, particularly federal law, um, products that uh, contain higher than 0.3% of THC um, are considered federally illegal. That's whenever we get into the state-run medical marijuana program. So for the average uh, um, consumer or, or, or patient that's going to be going out, say, to a pharmacy or maybe even down the road to the local gas station or in a pocket there, those type of CBD products, are are going to have uh, they're going to be derived from hemp, which by definition hemp is a species of cannabis that is very high in CBD and very low in THC. In order to be considered legal under federal uh, mandates and regulations, that has to have less than 0.3 percent of, of THC in the product. Now, it can be further delineated. Not all products have to have THC in them or not all CBD products. So, for example, we further break these down to what we call a full-spectrum product, a broad-spectrum product, or an isolate. And really, the difference between these is relatively straightforward. A full-spectrum product is something that has all of the cannabinoids in it and the essential oils in it basically from that plant, including THC. So things like CBD, THC, CBG, CBN, all these different phytocannabinoids, but a full-spectrum product contains small amounts of THC in it. A broad-spectrum product, on the other hand, contains everything that I just mentioned outside of the THC. So in a broad-spectrum product, you might have CBD and CBN and CBG, but there will be zero THC. The third and final product is what we call an isolate. And really what an isolate is, it's just what it says. It's an isolated cannabinoid. So you might have a CBD isolate, which means that it would be something along the lines of 99.9% CBD. So it would be CBD alone. So when we talk about full spectrum, broad spectrum, and isolate, those are the rough definitions. And those are relatively common terms that are used in the medical cannabis industry today. Thank you, Dr. Donner. You're listening to Let's Talk on WISR 680 AM. Dr. Brian Donner is with us, Chief Medical Officer and Co-Founder of Compassionate Certification Centers. Uh, Dr. Donner, you uh, got into this a little bit earlier, but I just wanted to know, how does CBD work inside the body? Does, does a specific product target a body system or area, or is it more of once the CBD is in the system, it's, it's just drawn to the area that's, that's kind of in need of attention or, or lacking? This is a good question, Ryan, and it goes back to what we had spoke about before with the body's internal endocannabinoid system and these these series of receptors and then these molecules like CBD that either bind to the receptor or act around that receptor. So similar systems we have in our body that people may have heard of, such as uh, uh, serotonin or dopamine or norepinephrine, they work on a similar system of this biochemical communication. So whenever a person takes CBD, uh, whether it's uh, inhaled or taken orally or topically, that then gets absorbed and it can be distributed into the bloodstream. One is, once it's into the bloodstream, it is able to interact with the CBD or with the CBD uh, receptor 
occurs within the endocannabinoid system throughout the body. And then by interacting with the different receptors, either a CB1 or a CB2 receptor, it can have a downstream physiological response, right? So for example, a patient takes CBD through the oral route, it's processed through the digestive system, it's incorporated into the bloodstream, it's able to then get distributed throughout the body, interact with those uh, endocannabinoid receptors, and one of the downstream responses might be something like uh, inflammation reduction, right? So whenever we talk about these molecules uh, and these medicines, that's how they work, and it's very, very similar to traditional uh, medications and pharmaceuticals. Excellent. Um, I was doing a little bit of research on um, on before this interview, before speaking with you, and I was uh, on the Compassionate Certification Center's website, and I saw that you guys offer a lot of different services. Is it possible for anyone to just walk in and purchase CBD products, or does a person need to have a doctor's appointment first? And I appreciate you bringing this up because there's there's a lot of confusion I think uh, out there, uh, particularly considering the different regulations and laws in, in the different states. So to answer your question, yes, anybody is able to come into one of our, um, our locations or clinics or go online to our website and purchase CBD. They do not need to have a medical marijuana certification or a card to obtain CBD products uh, on their own. All of our CBD products will. Continue Contain, um, if they're a full spectrum product, they'll contain less than 0.3% of THC. And as we discussed before, if they're a broad or broad spectrum product or an isolate, they'll contain zero THC. But those are available to anybody out there without any additional certification. Conversely, um, the medications that you'll find at the dispensaries throughout the state, these all typically are not derived from hemp. They are derived from, from mar the female marijuana plant. So by definition, they're, they're most likely going to have a higher level of THC and potentially even a lower level of CBD. In order to obtain one of those type of products from the actual dispensaries in Pennsylvania, that's whenever a patient will have to have a medical marijuana certification based off of one of the qualifying conditions in the state of Pennsylvania. A kind of a follow-up question uh, with that is, is, what are the benefits of, of becoming a patient and receiving guidance from a professional through those available options as opposed to, you know, doing self-research and, and kind of guessing about what, what a person might need? And this is, is so, so intrinsically important. I'm really glad that you brought it up. So number one, I would say I, I encourage all of our patients to do some self-learning and some self-education because the more they're able to understand things on their own, really the, the, the better they're going, the better results they're going to have from those medications. But I can tell you that, that over the years, we have seen uh, tens of thousands of patients at, at, at our clinics. And one of the things that, that we have noticed in the patterns are that but generally speaking, when patients don't have any guidance or any education or any background, they're not able to make the appropriate decisions when it comes to the route of administration, the frequency of the medication that they're taking, or that the dosage that they're taking. And oftentimes what this leads to is treatment failures. So I've had so many patients who come into the office to see me, uh, say for their medical marijuana certification, and when I discuss with them about CBD products, they say, oh, no, I tried those, and it didn't work. But then when I do some more digging, well, the products that they got may really may not have been quality products, or they were dosing themselves inappropriately or not the right frequency. And, and with the appropriate guidance, they might not have had that treatment treatment failure that they had before. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the, the areas that, that, that I believe compassionate certification centers uh, really excels, is that not only are we able to provide these products for our patients, but we're able to provide that education as well as ongoing support. I think that that makes us different some, than, from some of the other providers that are out there. Absolutely. Uh, let's focus in on uh, the Butler area for a few minutes. Uh, the local Compassionate Certification Center's office is located at 127 East Cunningham Street. Tell us about the increased use and popularity of this particular facility, as well as how many people have been helped in our area. Absolutely. So I, I'm proud to say that uh, our
Butler office was really one of our first few offices that we had, and it's still to this day what I, I would say one of our, our flagship offices, that uh, not only do, do we have uh, a high number of patients who come in for their certifications, but from a CBD and product standpoint, uh, um, there's we have a lot of our patients who come there consistently, and there's a lot of walk-in traffic based off of where it is. But uh, over the years, uh, I think we have seen well over um, – Six or 7,000 patients uh, at our Butler Clinic. Typically, we're seeing uh, hundreds of patients there uh, a month. Um, yeah, our clinic, I like to tell people, it is even on days when we're not seeing patients. Oftentimes, our clinic is open and staffed by our employees. So if you have questions about CBD, how to uh, obtain your medical marijuana certification card or anything at all, you can just walk in. So um, I feel that the, really we've become incorporated into the, into the community in Butler which has been fantastic, um, and still to this day, it's one of our busiest uh, offices uh, and really sort of serves, as, as I said, one of our flagship locations. Excellent. You're listening to Let's Talk on WISR 680 AM. I'm Ryan Saylor. I'm joined on the phone today by Dr. Brian Donner, who's taken time out of his busy schedule seeing patients. Um, he's chief medical officer and co-founder of Compassionate Certification Centers. Um, we've all been dealing with the effects of, of COVID-19 pandemic, and it's affected many aspects of, of many of our lives. How has Compassionate Certification Centers had to adjust to the current situation and, and kind of provide help differently? Yes, we all uh, live in a uh, dramatically different world than, than we did uh, just six months ago, and it's been been very difficult uh, for everybody. And, and with us in particular, I think there's been a few things that we've noticed. The biggest change that we have seen is the transition into uh, you know, telemedicine and having that uh, be available to, to all of our patients. Prior to the pandemic, that was not uh, telemedicine was not something that was able to be used for medical marijuana certifications and evaluations in the state of Pennsylvania. Secondary to the pandemic um, and the emergency um, uh, implementations that, uh, that have been in place, um, we have seen a just a massive rise in telemedicine appointments. Um, to the point where we're seeing hundreds of more patients a month. And really what this has done is it has uh, made things easier for the patients. We can take some of the anxiety out of coming to the office uh, and having to be um, uh, potentially in an enclosed space or with exposure to other folks that you don't want to. And we're also able to, patients are able to work around their schedule a little bit more easily, whether it be work or child care. And they typically can do this from the comfort of their own home, and it can be done just as effectively. So, I really think from our standpoint and really a uh, CCC's business model, that's what we've seen the most dramatic increase since COVID has started. Uh, I can tell you that uh, clinically, one of the things that we've seen with a lot of our patients, and uh, it fits in, with, uh, I would say, the rest of probably the global population, is, is really increased um, increased issues with, with, with me mental illness, what I would call psychological issues, particular, uh, particularly those being anxiety uh, and depression. Uh, we, we have seen uh, anxiety really, really increase uh, in, in our patient population during this time. And, uh, and during the, the, the pandemic, um, and, and, and CBD and medical cannabis can be really, really nice treatments, um, um, either as alone or as an adjunct when you're talking about things such as anxiety and PTSD. So those are really the two, I would say, main changes that, that we've seen on our end, uh, obviously, with a bunch of other small things uh, changing as, as the days go by. You mentioned uh, the telemedicine, and I wanted to get into that a little bit because I think it's really interesting. Um, if you would, tell us a little bit more about the option of, of those virtual visits. How does it work, and, and kind of what are the, the benefits and, and the pros and cons, and, and are you seeing more people take advantage of, of that choice now that it is an option? So, yeah, I will answer the second part of your question first here, and, and it's overwhelmingly yes. We, we are seeing an overwhelming uh, amount of patients really uh, migrate towards that, that telemedicine platform, and I think there's a number of variables that, that lead to that. It's not only a phenomenon in medical cannabis, but I think just across the, the general healthcare uh, landscape. So when we talk about telemedicine or virtual, what does that mean? Essentially, what it means is imagine an interaction action that would be similar to if you FaceTime somebody on your, your iPhone or an iPad, or if you had a Zoom meeting, uh, where you can basically have a virtual inter 
virtual face-to-face interaction with a provider while you're sitting in the comfort of your own home. This could be done from your home computer or laptop or from a tablet such as an iPad or a lot of people even do this from their phone. What it enables uh, our patients to do is really uh, make things a lot easier. So you could imagine where now I could do this from my own home. I don't need to take time off of work. I don't need to drive into an appointment. I don't need to look for parking. I don't need to sit in an office uh, and wait uh, if anybody is behind. So it's really streamlined things for patients and made it uh, much easier for them. From a technical, uh, from a technological standpoint, nowadays things are really straightforward. We even see a lot of our elderly uh, patients into their 80s, uh, even some uh, some folks in the 90s who are able to to use the telemedicine platform without any issues at all. And once they do it, um, most of our patients say they're so glad that they did um, because it really makes things easier from their own end personally. Definitely sounds like there are a lot of positive reasons to to take advantage of that uh, telemedicine uh, virtual visit option. Are there any drawbacks that you're aware of of not being able to see a patient face-to-face? And and if so, how are the patients that are being uh, treated that way uh, able to overcome that? Or how are you able to, uh, I guess, deal with uh, the the, uh, the negative aspect of not being able to see people face-to-face? Absolutely. It's a, it's a great question. And I would say this, in, uh, particularly when we're, we're talking about medical cannabis specifically. So I would say a few things. Number one, you actually do get to have a face-to-face interaction, right? It's just not live and in person. And mm-hmm. there can be a lot of information that is gathered just by being able to look to somebody and talk to them in real time, even if you're not within, within arm's length of them, right? So, um, and, and then piggybacking off of that, when you look at medical cannabis, cannabis as a specialty, um, it's really uh, more, I would say, cerebral driven, right? So can, medical cannabis and its treatment, it doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, involve a lot of procedures. There's not anything that's done typically that's invasive. So these are the type of uh, uh, specialties that suit themselves to telemedicine uh, very well. Something where that it's going to be a lot of discussion between the provider and the patient, um, but there might not have to be a lot of physical interaction or physical intervention if that makes sense. So medical cannabis is actually set up very well from a telehealth platform, and I don't really think that we lose anything from a uh, from an overall or global standpoint. Marvelous. I mentioned the Compassionate Certification Center's website a little bit earlier, and it was evident when I was on that site that your organization is very involved with community outreach efforts. What kind of efforts uh, do you have currently underway, and, and why is this important to CCC? So this, that's something that the CCC really, really believes in uh, deeply, and it's something that, that we've been a part of really since our uh, organization's inception. I, I think when you look at medical cannabis as, uh, as it's uh, been integrated into healthcare, one of the, the really neat and interesting things to me is that this was something that's, that's been really patient-driven. It hasn't been driven by doctors or researchers or scientists or big pharma. It's really been driven by patients who are looking for answers, where oftentimes traditional healthcare hasn't, hasn't met their needs, right? So whenever you have something like this that's such a, such a patient-driven um, specialty. Uh, in my opinion, that's really, really what helps uh, makes things go. Patients, what we find, Ryan, it's, uh, and uh, just a, as a general comment, um, patients are so interested in, in learning more about medical cannabis so that they can treat themselves better. And, and uh, an analogy I, I make to a lot of my patients is that, uh, you know, me as the physician in, with medical cannabis, I'm, I'm putting some more tools in your toolbox so that you're able to then better treat yourself. And, and, and I think, uh, generally speaking, the, the paradigm of medicine is, is, is shifting that way towards individualized medicine. So cannabis fits right in that paradigm and sort of where where I in particular believe things are going. Thank you, Dr. Donner. Uh, You're listening to Dr. Brian Donner, Chief Medical Officer and co-founder of Compassionate Certification Centers here on Let's Talk WISR 680 AM. Um, I just wanted to get your thoughts on a, a couple of other things here. Uh, we've recently seen in the news that Governor Tom Wolf has come out in favor of recreational marijuana. As an advocate of uh, mar- medical marijuana and a clinical researcher, uh, as you are, what are your feelings about the benefits or dangers, I guess, of uh, recreational marijuana use? 
Yes, uh, you can imagine that I've gotten this question uh, quite frequently over the last few days. Right. Uh, you know, and, and I guess I would let, let me preface it with this, Ryan, that, that, that I really focus, and so does our organization, on, on medical cannabis. And I try not to get too intimately involved from uh, an adult use or a recreational standpoint. I can tell you this, and this is something that I, that I know absolutely for sure. When, if and when the time comes for recreational or adult use uh, to be integrated into Pennsylvania or any other state for that matter, I, I, I urge everybody uh, just to keep in mind and to always keep the patients first. One of the things that, that could easily happen is that, um, you know, whenever you talk about going from medical marijuana to recreational or adult use marijuana, you can't just flip this like a switch. There's infrastructure behind this that needs to be built up and it needs to be able to to support all, everybody who's out there, all of the consumers. Most importantly, it needs to be able to support patients. When you look at the medical cannabis program in Pennsylvania, we've really just gotten to the point not that long ago that we were robust enough to have adequate supply for our product or for our ad- product supply for our patients to get all of the growers uh, and the dispensaries really up and running. So, and that's what the, you know, I think last time I checked, there was just over 300,000 patients who had been registered or certified in the Pennsylvania State Program. You can imagine now with a population of around 12 and a half million in Pennsylvania, what happens overnight whenever those type of rules are changed? Right, there there would be a, a major major supply and demand problem, and and that's the one thing when people ask me this question, I ask them to always keep in mind that no matter how you feel about recreational cannabis use, always keep in mind that that patients should come first. The program was initiated and formed for the patients, and we should always keep their best interest in mind, no matter how uh, how things change moving forward. You're listening to Let's Talk on WISR 680 AM. I'm Ryan Saylor. Today I'm joined on the phone by Dr. Brian Donner, Chief Medical Officer and co-founder of Compassionate Certification Centers. Um, If you could, Dr. Donner, talk for a a few minutes about the social media presence of Compassionate Certification Centers. How does your organization utilize those tools to reach people, and, and what can people expect from CCC's social media platforms? Absolutely. I'm going to do my I chuckle because uh, I'm not our social media guy, uh, and so I'm sure my partner will laugh at me whenever she hears this, but I will give you the best answer that, that I can. Sure. So um, our CEO, uh, Melanie, has put in together sort of a, a robust not only marketing platform, but really across all of the, the social media platforms, and whether this is uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, um, and, and to the point where not only are we able to have our patients communicate with us during during, uh, or through those platforms, but we're also able to communicate really prudent information out there to our patients through those platforms. So a wonderful example is this. Um, uh, not too long ago, we did the first uh, really large uh, retrospective data analysis collection from a research standpoint on medical cannabis patients um, in Pennsylvania. And what we were able to do is through our social media platforms, we were able to reach out to not only our medical cannabis patients, but also other medical cannabis patients across the state, and then they were able to subsequently participate in that research program that we had. So social media, I think, in our case, is used not only for the traditional uh, mechanisms, but I think also we use it from a, from a clinical aspect as well to, ter- to try to communicate information to our patients and to everybody else out there so that they have the most up-to-date information and that they know where to go for follow-up. Absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. Um, We've covered a lot of ground today, but um, is there anything else that you would like to uh, let folks know about uh, that's going on with uh, Compassionate Certification Centers? Um, I think one of the the really neat things is that we, uh, as our adjacent states here, start to uh, incorporate medical cannabis. You'll likely see Compassionate Certification Centers, not only with uh, offices in Pennsylvania, but in also uh, other states as well. And so that may be something that's not only available in a brick-and-mortar fashion, but also through a telemedicine platform, too. So uh, I would tell people just that to keep their eyes out, because uh, we'll likely be expanding not only towards the eastern part of the state, 
but also into the some of the other states as well. And also really for our patients and for everybody out there to please keep your eyes open for these new and additional services that we're going to be offering. These services are based off of patient need and really out of our patients coming to us uh, and us trying to be able to fill the gap. So we, we hope to, uh, over the latter course of this year and then into uh, 2021, really incorporate more of those new services into our, uh, our platform. The local Compassionate Certification Center's office is located here in Butler at 127 East Cunningham Street. I've definitely learned a lot today, uh, Dr. Don. I very much appreciate it. I'm sure others have as well. Thank you so much for, for taking the time out of your busy schedule, um, talking with patients and, and helping folks uh, to join us on the show today. I appreciate it. I appreciate it too, Ryan. Thanks for the great questions, and uh, you have a great day. Thanks, you too. I'm Ryan Saylor. Have a great day, and we'll talk to you next time on Let's Talk.